what you really are communicating to people is what your values are. You don't have to call them values. But if you say every child can learn, you are setting forth a set of values, whether you call them that or not. Many organizations, of course, as you know, have gone on and they have value statements or our three critical values or whatever. Doesn't matter. If you've got a mission, you can have a set of values. In fact, you will be communicating values simply by stating your mission. That is the first step in an effective organization. Notice that the first step isn't having a quality service or a quality product. Today, if you don't have that, you're not even involved in it. There isn't even a chance of being successful. So that isn't even down here as number one. The second step is if we have a set of values, we need to build those values into the culture. Now here again, one of those wonderful words, culture like mission statement. But the simple fact, as the sociologists have long told us, is that when you get two or more people together, there is a culture involved, meaning the interaction of those folks one with another. And we know today that a culture is a prime motivator of our behaviors in our jobs and in our lives. And so if we can translate those values into a culture, what we end up with is shared values. So now we've got a group of folks who do share some values and are ready to start talking about one clear voice to external publics. Because now we're talking about going out beyond the school family into the community and building relationships. When I was introduced, you were told that I was in public relations. I want to make sure you understand what that means. Because I'm not even sure all the people in the field understand what that means. Public relations is the process. It's like nursing or teaching. It's a process. The goal is public relationships in which people can relate to one another, discuss their differences, and in that way, govern themselves as our democratic ideal says we should do. Well, if we've got a set of shared values, we can go out and build relationships. Think about how we do it in our democracy. What is the Pledge of Allegiance? How about that anthem that we sang? Aren't those the cliches, the power statements that we use to keep reminding ourselves of what our values are? Well, that's all I'm talking about, is applying that kind of thinking, which we all know so well. Religions are prime examples of the use of this kind of a technique. Why can't we apply it since it works so well right here in our schools? Now, when we go outside and build those relationships, what we're really doing is putting forth expressed values. We have a set of values. We get them shared inside the organization. And then we go outside and we express those values. And if we do these three steps, there's a fourth step. And that step is reputation. Because all a reputation is, is understood values. Now, if we don't do those three steps, of course, we'll also have a reputation, but it may not be the one we want. Now, let's just talk about that for a minute, because I think it's critical that we understand the psychology of reputation. There's a lot of talk in this country ever since a Harvard Business School professor in 1956 came up with this, this awful word, image. You know, what's the image of the school? What's the image of a product? Well, it is a false word. You know what an image is? It's a false representation of something. And I want to get away from thinking about having an image. I want to think about having a reputation. Because an image immediately dissipates and disappears as soon as you have personal experience with a product, an institution, a service, a school.
school, a school system, as soon as you've had some experience with it, some relationship, you don't believe the image anymore. Let me give you an example. Some folks come over to your house and they say, oh, you have to go to Gino's restaurant. It's the greatest. You've got to go to Gino's. And you keep hearing about this and hearing about this. And finally you say, okay, okay, I'll go to Gino's. So you go to Gino's, this great image buildup. Is it going to be possible for Gino to be as good as you were told Gino's was going to be? Or is Gino set up to fail because of this image presentation? Well, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about us building a reputation for the schools. Sure, we're going to use techniques like a, a new cliche, a new phrase to do it. We're going to get value shared. But in reputation is going to come out of relationships that are built with people. And it's going to be based on whether or not they understand our values. Let me give you another example. When you purchase products and services from other organizations in your daily lives, think how reputation is at work. For instance, do you have an auto repair shop whose values you understand and trust so well that you drive a car in the morning on the way to school and you talk to the kids and say, here you go, Charlie, just give it whatever it needs. Do you have that kind of auto repair shop? Or do you go in and say, uh, before we get started here, would you list exactly what you're going to do and exactly how much it's going to cost, right? Well, you see, experience with auto repair shops has led to that kind of reputation. And we want it to be the other way around in our model of being successful. Well, as you can see, the key is right about here. And it's the principle of one clear voice. If we can get values shared, we can get values expressed in a way that people can understand. And if we can't do that, we've got a problem. So let's talk about some of the techniques for making this happen. First question is where we start. What should the message or the appeal be? Business is brisk. What is your business is brisk? Your Star Wars. Is it that every child can learn, or is that maybe still too education ease, too arcane? Is it what the businessmen would like to have us be saying, that education prepares the workers for tomorrow? Well, maybe. I find that awfully narrow. I'd like to think that education does more just get us a job and make us cogs in an economic wheel. Is it something about the district itself? Is it that Chesterfield delivers the best education for minimum dollars? Or is that risky? Because they all say, boy, that's right. We can minimize it even more. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But I know this. When you go into your breakout groups afterwards, I hope you will think very carefully about this message. And I'm purposely not going to lead you much further in this, because my experience with this process is that as you start thinking about what that message or appeal ought to be, and you come together finally on what it is and start speaking with it, all of you will have been involved and it undoubtedly will represent the values that you are comfortable with. Clearly, that's the first question. What should this message or appeal be? The second question is, what vehicles or media should we use to deliver this message? How are we going to get this new classroom of the whole community to understand what we're talking about? And I'll talk about that in a minute. The third question is, who are the prime targets for this message? Should we try to reach everybody in the community, every voter? I guess it must be pretty obvious that I would urge you against attempting that. It's just really not possible. It's a sad fact in American life that 80 to 90 percent of the people really don't care. And I can say that on any subject, any subject. Our research is absolutely Undeniable, 80 to 90% of the public don't care 
on every subject. But of course, the difference is the same in year and nine years. We have narrowed ourselves down into focus interest groups, and we don't care about the rest. The sociologists uh, talk about this a good deal. They say that the American public on most topics has become ignorant and apathetic. <coughs> and if you do some research and you go and you say, are you ignorant and apathetic? The answers come back the same every time. I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> now it's important to remember that. It's important to remember that because if we think we're going to reach every Because psychology tells us something else. What it tells us is that groups don't just do things kind of spontaneously. Suddenly everybody in a certain group looks at each other and says, gee, we ought to do X. No, not how it happens. Instead, opinion leaders drive the group's thinking and eventually motivate its behavior. So clearly we need to target the right publics, the right interest groups, but we also need to know who the opinion leaders are in those groups and really concentrate on them. And I'm going to talk about some methods for doing that here quickly in a minute. And then finally, we come to this question of how do we get this diverse group of educators, all you independent cousins, to agree to participate in a One Clear Voice program? Well, let's take these questions one by one and start talking about them. Maybe the best way to answer several of those questions is to look at what we know about how people out there will ultimately make their decisions about education right here in this district. They will do it according to a almost 40-year-old study now called Diffusion Process. I trust many of you are familiar with Diffusion probably studied it in school. That doesn't, of course, mean you remember it, but I think it'll be, it'll be of interest to you. Diffusion is, is a long, as I said, 40-year series of studies to determine how the people make decisions. The diffusion studies began when research started showing that people do not make decisions based on information. Did you hear that? People do not make decisions based on information. Forget facts. Nobody cares about the facts. People care about perceptions. That's my interpretation of the facts. And so each of us has our own perception. Now, I know that's something educators don't like to hear either. But let me just see if I can, can, can show you this. The perceptual shield that Mother Nature puts around us when we come into this world as infants turns out to be the driving force of our existence. And here's why. We're born into this world. All we have going for us is some as yet untouched gray matter and a little bit of intuition in our guts. That's all we got going for us. And here we are popped in this huge, dangerous, strange world. So Mother Nature says, yeah, I'm going to give you some kind of protection. So she put this perceptual shield around us. And it stays with us all our lives because the world continues to have elements that we don't know, we don't understand. And what the perceptual shield is, is a technique by which all of our systems, and literally all of our systems, our six senses, our intelligence, our knowledge base, our emotion, our intuition, all of those in 30 milliseconds or less, according to the psychologists, give us a sum total of everything we know about the situation we are currently facing. And that is called a perception. The psychologists say that every idea that crosses our mind and every object that crosses our visual plane is, in, is immediately responded to with a perception. Now, fortunately, many of these are subconscious. Otherwise, we just kind of be standing there going, bleep, 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 all day all these darn perceptions, you see? But that's how the system works. So you see, it's understandable why facts don't mean very much anymore. It's not the fact because my facts are not your facts. My perception is obviously not your perception, but most often we can't agree on the facts because we're both coming at it from our set of perceptions. And so, when we're going to build relationships with people, we need to begin with that understanding. By the way, it also means we need to begin by first listening to the people we want.
want to communicate with. We'll find out what their perceptions are so we don't immediately bomb them with our facts and turn them off and stiffen their resistance. First, we need to hear where they're coming from, and then we can say, gee, those are your interesting perceptions. Let me tell you how I see it, and then maybe we can discuss whether we can kind of change each other's opinions a little bit. Now, I know this is a very difficult principle, and you know, really, we should have four hours of instruction in this, but let me see if I can demonstrate it to you in one simple example. Sometimes I use myself as a sort of an example of the difference between fact and perception. After I was uh, so nicely introduced, I got up here, some of you looked at me and said, oh my lord, he's wearing a kind of a gray striped suit. My brother-in-law wears one of those. He can't know anything. <laughs> Others of you said, well, you know, I don't know, he's, uh, he's a Yankee. He doesn't talk like us down here. And some of you, and you know, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sensitive about this. Some of you immediately said, wow, that guy is really getting bald, right? <laughs> I want to make sure that my thinking is going to be in sync 
with the folks around me. Or if not, I want to find out to what extent it isn't in sync. Now, I know this comes as a blow to us in this country because we all think we're independent. I make up my own mind. Nobody tells me what to do. Have any of you ever used phrases like that? You know what? It's a damn lie. 98% of us don't do anything according to solid research without checking it out with somebody else. But you're looking dubious, so I shall prove it to you. Next time you go out to eat with a gang and the menus are passed out, what's the first word out of somebody's mouth? <laughs> of course. What are you going to have? We can't even order lunch. <laughs> and I'm checking it out with somebody else. Now, is this negative? No, this is not negative. If you just back off a little bit and think about it, I say thank goodness for it. Suppose that we had 257 million Americans, each one of whom demanded do it my way. The system would break down. In other words, it's this willingness to compromise, to follow opinion leaders, to have some give and take that makes a democratic, self-governing society possible. And it all happens right here. But this does tell us something. This tells us that peers and opinion leaders have to be part of our program because the fact is that if they validate our initial decision that we made ourselves based on information, chances are we'll adopt the idea. If they don't, chances are we will reject the idea. Now, like all postulations of a large population, there are small percentages of folks at either end who don't fit. Some people, in fact, always will do the opposite of what the group is doing. It's a very small percentage, about 1.5% on average, but that's their personality, is to be different. But the great majority of folks, the ones we need to get behind our program, they make decisions this way. Now stop thinking. This tells us two things if we're going to have a one clear voice program. In fact, when Ely Hugh Katz in 1964 published the first compilation of all the research, he called his article the two-step flow of information and influence. Notice the two steps. You've got to have a formal information program or some way of making people aware and satisfying their, their limited, but nonetheless, their interests. Then we need to have a second step where those people are talked to face-to-face, -face, personally, by peers and opinion leaders. Now, how might we bring that kind of knowledge to a one clear voice program? I think the answer is fairly clear. To me, at least, it's fairly clear because I've seen this work in so many cases. One way is to establish school community relations or school public relations teams in each school. Now, maybe you already have those. If you do, hallelujah, good for you. If you do, give them a reinvigorating shot of adrenaline. If you don't, Think about setting them up. Now, notice what I said. I said, in the schools, there's another little postulation I have to share with you, because it's being experienced all across the country. And senior administrators and people who work in the central office and board members, shut your ears. I don't want you to hear this, but the fact is, you cannot sell schools to the public from the central office. It's just that simple. You can coordinate it there, you can strategize it there, you can pro provide the services there, but nobody can get their arms around a school district. It's too big a concept. Not only that, those people don't teach anybody, they just waste and spend money. We all know that, right? Well, that's what they know out there. And so what we're learning is relationships in the community, that relationship step that expresses our values with one clear voice has to be done on a school-by-school -school basis. Why? Very simple. I may not be able to get my arms around or understand the district, but I certainly can understand the school where my kids go, my neighbor's kids go, my grandkids go, and if I have an empty nester, the school that I have to drive by to get to the supermarket. That's real. That's part of what the psychologist called my mental furniture. It's part of my life. The district isn't part of my life. And most Americans wish it would get out of our lives. And so therefore, school public relations or school community relations teams, whatever you want to call them, have been probably the number one tool. And what these teams do is to put together 
volunteer folks in the school family, hopefully at all levels, maybe some administrators of the school is big enough to have more than a principal, certainly some teachers, some staff people, maybe some very committed parents, maybe some students in the senior grades if it's a high school. And these folks draw up a community relationship building plan for that school. And then they go out and they talk to people. They find out who those opinion leaders are, and they go out and they build relationships with them. <clears throat> I was talking about this to a district not long ago, and somebody stood up the back and said, why, why, that's the oldest idea in the world. I said, that's it, right out. That's why it's so effective. This is what we've been doing since we all crawl out of the cave. As soon as we talk to one another, we share. We show people who may be our worst critics that, hey, you may not like what we're doing, but we're okay, people. So we tone the rhetoric down one notch. We just realize, well, you know, they're misguided over there, but they're nice people. That's the first step. Then the second step is, well, gee, you know, maybe they have got a rationale for what they're doing, and maybe, possibly, we can even get them to the third step, which is, well, you know, they're good people, and they've got a rationale for what they're doing. Maybe I ought to support them. Maybe I ought to work with them. School PR teams are the most effective device that I have found in my long experience of working with schools. In fact, they're so effective. Let me just give you one example. In a district in the Pacific Northwest, for four years in a row, they needed to pass a bond issue to be able literally to fix leaks in the roof. I mean, it was that bad. The roofs really were leaking badly. Buildings were deteriorating in the wet conditions up there. And for four years in a row, the district ran a campaign, and it lost every time by about 70 to 30. They said, well, what else can we do? And I said, why don't you get the district out of this and let each school, they have 37 schools in this, in this district, so let, let each school run their own little campaign. And they said, but it'll be awful. Some of the newsletters they'll put out will be terrible, and we'll have misspellings. And I said, great. The people will know it's real. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. If it ain't slick, See, but it looks like it just, you know, it isn't gorgeously designed and it isn't for color, but it's from my neighborhood school, I'm probably going to pay attention to that. And they did that and they got out and they saw the folks within their catchment areas. Guess what? The fifth year it passed 70 to 30. So we went out and we did some research afterwards. We said, how come you voted against this for four years and you voted for it the fifth year? You know what people said? Why didn't you tell us you needed money? Think about that. Why didn't you tell us you needed money? That, to me, illustrates the power. People need to hear about it from something that's relevant to their lives, and that means a school with which they either have or can feel some attachment. So school PR teams are one method. Other systems are using an ambassador program in which it may not be a formal school public relations team, but across the system, People who are willing and who are capable